Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, where we are not having the decoding. We're not doing a supplementary material episode. We're doing an interview with another academic, Flint Dibble. So I'm Chris Kavanagh, anthropologist extraordinaire of sorts, not really, but kind of. And Matt is Matthew Brown, a psychologist. And we have with us Flint Dibble, an archaeologist and classical archaeologist, I believe, from Mm -hmm. Dartmouth. Is that correct? No, I'm at Cardiff University. I taught at Dartmouth a few years ago. Yeah. There we go. So in good academic style, the your profile remains on their website <laughs> yeah, as, as if you're a current <laughs> member. So I, uh, my Google skills have let me down. So Flint is uh, a classical archaeologist and we'll talk a bit about his research. However, recently he became internet famous of sorts because he <laughs> appeared on the Joe Rogan experience, Joe Rogan podcast um, to debate Atlantis or uh, ancient civilizations with the well-known proponent of that, Graham Hancock. And I think it was a four, maybe four and a half hour episode. Yeah. Uh, so that was a, it felt a, longer. A, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's even longer than our normal episode. So that's quite <laughs> an achievement. And Flint also has a YouTube channel where he does science communication, not just about ancient civilizations. So, But about real civilizations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll cover some of that. But Matt, I believe you had a question that you thought would help orientate people who might not know any of the relevant details about archaeology or pseudo-archaeology for that matter. Yeah, pseudo-archaeology. Why don't we, why don't we start there? So for, for the people who don't know much about it or Graham Hancock, could you maybe just give us a bit of an overview of what his, what his theory is and why is it considered to be pseudo-archaeology and not real archaeology? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Graham Hancock, he's an author who, who's been publishing for about 30 years on topics in human history history and prehistory. I think he started off as a journalist. He wrote about poverty in East Africa. And then some his first, his biggest book still to date was Fingerprints of the Gods. And it basically argues that all the information archaeologists have on prehistory is wrong. And there's this lost civilization that existed in the Ice Age that was destroyed in a great flood. And a few survivors taught hunter-gatherers around the world, the secrets of civilization, things like agriculture, monumental architecture, engineering, arts, stuff like that. This idea is not a new one. He's not the first person to argue this. This this comes out of the history of Atlantis, especially in the 19th century. A scholar named, not a scholar, sorry, but he was actually a congressman, like a senator. An author named Ignatius Donnelly wrote this book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World about this sort of idea of Atlantis and survivors teaching everybody around the world, all this kind of technology and stuff like that. Um, I get a lot of pushback online, as do other archaeologists, for labeling him a pseudo-archaeologist because Graham does not claim to be an archaeologist. He claims to be a journalist investigating this. But to me, as an archaeologist, the reason why he'd be a pseudo-archaeologist is because he claims he knows more about the past and the fields of study that that so many scholars devote their lives to, you know, studying human history and prehistory. And so it's that kind of strong claim saying, I know more than you all, you're all wrong and you're all trying to silence me and suppress what I have to say, that that's what makes him a pseudo archaeologist, if you see what I mean, is that kind of rhetoric. And he, he had a TV show on Netflix that was in the top two in the US and the UK and top 10 worldwide called Ancient Apocalypse, where it really was started off even within the first five minutes, all archaeologists are arrogant, they're patronizing, they're trying to shut me up, and I am rewriting the paradigm of history. That's how he put it. He's rewriting the par- or <laughs> paradigm of history. And so it's like, come on, this is uh, this is clearly trying to say you know more than all of us scholars that, that actually do all this work around the world. Yeah. When I was checking out this um, Atlantis civilization, I was surprised at how specific he was about some of the aspects of it. Like, for instance, he claims that they they had technologies that were more spiritual or psychic in nature rather than technological. And that, that perhaps explains why we don't see many um, artifacts of it. And of course, infamously, also they are perhaps, you know, um, blonde or, or white. <laughs> so, I mean, does, does he have any, like, how does he support those? 
those kinds of things. I, I presume that he can't well, point to some fu- funny looking rocks and go, that was made <laughs> by a white guy. <laughs> well, so, okay. So about the tele, both of those things actually are very subtly mentioned in his writings or his okay. TV show. Uh, the telekinesis and the psychic powers is something he actually goes on more about in interviews like on Joe Rogan or other sort of podcasts. He does write about it, but it's very kind of, toned down in his books. It's not really mentioned on his TV show. So it's something that he does talk about. I guess I'm not 100% sure how this is, but I think he leads ayahuasca adventures somewhere. So it's also connected with Mm. that, the psychic telekinesis stuff. But I would say that that except for some of his hardcore fans, that's something he oftentimes tries to downplay. In terms of the white-skinned people that came, that's also something that over the last 10, 20 years, he does try to downplay, to give him credit. Yeah, He wrote about it more in his first book. Not It's not his actually first book, but his first book on this topic, Fingerprints of the Gods, where what he did was he took kind of 19th century sources or Spanish colonial sources about indigenous America and mythology in indigenous America that talked about sort of white skin deities like Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha and stuff like that. And of course, all this sort of material that he's drawing on, it, it itself is very colonialist and racist. And so very problematic in that sense, where if you look at pre-contact sources for white skin deities, there are none. It's it, there are the, the depictions of their deities in Mesoamerica, they have tan skin, right? They're, they're, they're not white skinned at all. And we have a few surviving Maya and Aztec and other manuscripts that show these deities quite clearly. And so this is this is a misuse of this kind of evidence. I would say that some of his fans are much more overt in claiming that this is a white civilization, but uh, he never does to give him credit. I was not trying to say that he does that, but he does misuse these sources and he does not think about them critically. And I don't think he addresses the fact that so many of his fans take it as a white civilization. And I, I think his idea now is actually that this Atlantis came from the Americas. One of his latest books, America Before, uh, actually tries to sort of make that argument. Though he's very comfortable switching where it came from. His first book, it was in An- Antarctica. Now it's in the Americas. He, 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 to him, it's a lost civilization still yet to be found, if you see what I mean, which is great for him because you can just say, we don't have evidence and that helps prove me true. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a very specific question I intended to ask later about it, but since we're on the topic now, so whenever you were on Rogan and the issue came up about the potential colonial accounts and the fact that representations of white skinned people could relate to, you know, the the kind of influence of colonial powers. And Joe Rogan seemed quite open to that yeah. possibility, right, during the discussion. However, whenever the specific term white supremacy was referenced, right, in, in one of your articles, and as you said, you were talking about the sources that Adam yeah. Graham was drawing from. But I, I was kind of curious because that term is like a you know a, a trigger term so to, for clearly <laughs> yeah yeah and given your interest in science communication and that kind of thing whenever you're writing about that do you ever consider that like you know if you use a slightly different term like if you were to say that the outdated racial stereotypes or whatever i it, that it might engender like, le- I don't know if it would, but I just felt that. I don't think it would. It, <laughs> yeah, it would make a difference. I mean, I, that's the issue. We live in this charged world and, you know, people want to take whatever buzzwords they can and, and, and appropriate them into what it means about your identity and stuff like that. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I do public communication, but I think it's best to just be blunt. <laughs> if you see yeah. what I mean, say it as it is. Some people are going to listen and some people are not. And that's just how I see this world. You're never going to say something in a way that's going to hit everybody. And so you you need to obviously think about who your audience is. A lot of the writing that I've done, like, for example, it was in the Conversation UK. The majority of people that read that are academics or college yeah. university educated people so i was writing for that audience on the other hand when i'm on joe rogan i'm trying to speak to a different audience the audience that listens there which is predominantly not college educated so i'm going to change the kind of 
language that I use in that context. And so I think that that's part of the problem of the internet sometimes is it creates this kind of context collapse where you are addressing one audience in one situation and other audience in a different situation. And then all of a sudden it just gets collapsed as people take your words and spin them out of context as, as happened there. There's not much we can do about that. We just have no, to go with it, you know? But Flint, <laughs> why, why then you put it at the top and bold of your... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, just Flint didn't do that. But uh, no, you should... know, I think I think that was one of the things that made Joe Rogan realize that Graham Hancock was really attacking me in these kind of petty ways. Was because that that was not me that did that, or he took that tweet I had where I had big archaeology and scare quotes. Oh. It was just totally sarcastic, and it's like this is such a petty argument. Like, how are you twisting well, this in this way? Flit, this is a slight <laughs> aside, but we we covered a little bit of the debate on uh, like just a breakdown of some of the various techniques, and you know it, it was interesting from the point of view of like debating and and the kind of secular guru tactics that we cover. But the one note was there was this very clear parallel where I don't know if you've ever come across Mick West. I've seen him on Twitter some, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he he covers UFO. He's like yeah, sort exactly, of you yeah. know, giving technical explanations for various UFO videos and uh, and doing investigations. But um, he was in an engagement with an IDW figure, Eric Weinstein, and during it, he mentioned that he likes doing these puzzles because it it flexes his muscles, and mm -hmm. then Eric the reference to flex as him like flexing you know he has in, in terms of yeah, internet yeah. lingo and and yeah. Mick was like oh no no i you know I, I i don't use the word like that i didn't mean it like that and eric was very very strongly like no now you're correcting me saying that that's wrong and it, it we pointed out it's very similar to when you said to graham but but like there's quotation marks so i'm obviously yeah. being sarcastic and he's like oh sorry I missed that. So you weren't, <laughs> I, I will admire that you had quite a lot of patience. I could sense exasperation at various times. And, and actually, again, on the subject of exasperation, um, we'll probably jump around a bit, but when you are repeatedly, for those who haven't seen the, um, like the episode, there is quite a lot of times where both Rogan and Graham kind of present you with images that are, you know, impressive or or at least, you know, the like visual representation at a amateur's glance can often look quite impressive. And they would say, but doesn't that look man-made, right? And, <laughs> and no matter how many times that you repeated that, even in the case where you said, you know, like, <laughs> yes, I understand it, you know, there are aspects of it that could look that way, but that's not how we can assess anything. Yeah. It felt like that point didn't really, like you said that <laughs> must have been, 10 times or so, but it continued to come up. That's a tough point to get across. Cause like, you know, for me to be able to judge whether something looks like architecture is based on my experience seeing architecture from all over the world, right? And so the only way to really make that point really super crystal clear is to show people architecture from all over the world hundreds and thousands of images and that's what experience and expertise is and so that's why debunking is so difficult right you to be right. able to debunk and, and that's also why as i wrote in my piece that just came out on sunday in the guardian where the the value of prebunking and i went in there sort of asking to go first and saying that was a precondition for me to agree to do this was to actually get in there and show what evidence we actually have rather than sitting there and having to debunk a lot of shady things that aren't evidence, right? Because that's that's tough. It's tough, especially in that kind of quick oral setting, if you see what mm -hmm. I mean. And 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 especially where where you're dealing with two people who are uh especially Graham is definitely very much predisposed against me. But Joe also came into this as a Graham Hancock fan. And so uh so yeah it's not easy and it was never gonna be something that I could handle perfectly. And in particular what I thought was funny about that though and what really made me happy like a week afterwards is I realized that Graham, his entire strategy was either the victimization of me calling names or to go to non-archaeological sites, to go to these geological sites and try to make them look like archaeology, he actually avoided going to any actual archaeological sites. When we wanted to sit down and discuss this archaeological site in Indonesia, he's like, we don't have time. 
we don't have time. And so that told me he was a little worried about, about chatting with an archaeologist. He didn't want to get into the depths of actual archaeology because he goes to dozens of archaeological sites in his books and in his TV show and stuff like that. And he specifically avoided it. And so that sort of made me feel kind of good thinking about that in hindsight. It was like, ah, he was a bit worried about facing off with me. It wasn't just me a bit worried about the the venue and the profile of the event and stuff like that. Yeah. The preparation <laughs> really absolutely came through. And, you know, Matt and I have covered a whole bunch of material, including debates. And I was saying to Matt beforehand that I think this is the first successful guru debunking in a way of 2024 <laughs> which is which is, and it, it often doesn't go like that right i mean you, yeah. you referenced i saw the video you did breaking it down afterwards and talked about bill nye and ken ham and mm -hmm. people have various opinions about that but th there are those events where people are engaging with people with alternative theories or uh you know creationism in that case but uh yeah i will say that absolutely it came through loud and clear that you had prepared a oh, yeah. lot and 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 were able to speak to there was no point where something was raised and you were like well i have no idea what you're talking about like and not <laughs> that you could answer everything but you clearly were prepared and i'm just curious how much preparation went into the presentations are you given the whole thing because you know a four lot. hour conversation <laughs> with presentations and responded to arguments so how long did that take you? Well, we did, with a couple other colleagues, I did two practice debates over Zoom, um, which were each two hours long. I'd been doing research on Graham and Atlantis anyway, because I was planning on writing a book on this when the show came out, and I still am, but then I got sick. And so that's also what delayed this conversation and stuff like that. So I, I'd been sort of doing research into Graham a little bit and some of his ideas. And my book isn't about Graham, it's about Atlantis in general and why it's so popular and to explain for the general public why archaeologists aren't looking for it, right? You know, because we just aren't. And to really do that in an entertaining and interesting way to break down the archaeology of ancient Greece, the archaeology of the Ice Age. So I'd been doing that kind of research anyway. But uh, to prepare for the debate itself was, a, I don't even like to call it a debate because it wasn't like a formal debate, but whatever. Everybody calls it that. So I might as well, since I seem to have done well, just acknowledge what, what everybody wants <laughs> yeah. to call it. Um, so uh, I think my main prep for this was to listen to more of Graham on podcasts and stuff like that to see how he talks. And then, of course, look, I'm an archaeologist with my own focuses and specializations. So I had to do a lot of research that was outside of my wheelhouse, um, sort of into Mesoamerica and into Indonesia and stuff like that. And so with that, I got the help of a lot of colleagues to send me articles to read, to give me some takes. They helped out by giving me some slides and images and recording a few videos that I showed during the mm. conversation. Um, so I probably had a team of like 20 to 30 people that helped me out in bigger or littler or bigger ways. And yeah, I took off two weeks with vacation time to prepare. And then to, so I spent basically the two weeks beforehand just doing this full time. Before I agreed to do it, I had my general strategy. You know, I knew that I wanted to start with that erotic scene on on on, on Athenian vases, just because I thought that would be a funny way to make the point that we have these patterns. And that was my PhD supervisor. She's the one that published that, Kathleen Lynch at University of Cincinnati. And then I knew what my two sort of core arguments were, that he ignores Ice Age evidence and the domestication um, arguments that I brought up. I actually have a third which is the history of Atlantis, and we never got to talk about that. Um, but uh, I think he knew that that was my specialty, so he avoided that. So yeah, so I had that set, and yeah, it was a lot of prep, and that would be my advice to people is if you're going to actually engage with pseudoscientists, uh, make sure you know who you're arguing against and what their core arguments are so that you are ready to attack the specifics of how they present stuff. Um, because I think that was key, you know, when while preparing, I read Mehdi Hassan's, what is it, How to Win Every Argument. And one of his points was that when you argue against a celebrity, these celebrities, they rely on their media training. They're just used to saying the same kind of thing over and mm. over again, and they don't prep in the same way. So you can actually predict what they're gonna say and what they're gonna talk about. So that would be the first stage, and then, uh, the other key thing is I always think that the truth sandwich approach is important. We should be focusing on our actual evidence, not just on debunking. And so that then just gave me the research to, all right, hit up the plant domestication, hit up the Ice Age coastal stuff, that kind of stuff, and turn it into an engaging lecture rather than a debate, if you see what I mean. So yeah, that was kind of yeah. the thoughts behind my prep. I, I imagine it's quite difficult because some of the 
rhetorical arguments that are that are put to you are quite well they're just bad but they're not obviously bad to to a, to a lay audience and the, the, one of the ones that really struck me was when he was looking to pin you on what percentage of the sahara <laughs> desert had 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 been literally dug up and, yeah. and, the, and, and you could tell it like any answer less than 100 percent, unless they dug up every square foot of soil <laughs> in the sahara desert then we can't say for sure that there isn't an ancient civilization there but at, at the time i was thinking well how would i respond to that and i i wasn't sure um and i th think that was a tough one for you too yeah and i mean you know there is no real answer a we don't know how much it is and to be honest anywhere in the world what have we excavated like 0.0001% let's be honest i mean we have yeah. millions of sites but does that represent the entire planet no but is it representative of the entire planet of course you know we have just so much archaeology and you're trying to say that like when we go looking for ice age stuff in the sahara and we can find it like my dad did well what the fuck that's what we do we go and we find this stuff you're saying oh it's under this grain of sand you didn't check that one and it's like come on yeah. screw that man we have every single science is based upon incomplete knowledge that's just every single field of study is based upon incomplete knowledge that's life we don't have omniscience we have the evidence we have and we make really good arguments from it and so you know that's what we do mm. <laughs> first of all we should say that he he very much took on that um, like it's like a tone of grievance yeah he, he's, he's been victimized by by yourself and the entire uh, archaeology big archaeology <laughs> big archaeology <laughs> <In course. laughs> uh, and uh and it's a nice version of the um, the Galileo gambit that that he put out there, which is, yeah. look at these people; um, they were right, and and everyone said they were wrong. The, the implication being, you know, the same things happened to him. But you know, looking into those incidents, I think it's it's pretty common across in any academic field. You know, new ideas, new things, they do face a bit of an uphill battle in in getting you know the consensus to sort of shift so so i thought that was one of the few points where at least I even though he was using it for bad ends he was at least standing on stable ground yeah i mean look but i think that every single article we publish is a new idea you know that's what we do that's what a phd dissertation or thesis is that's what you know every article i've published is and so that's just sort of life that's that's how it goes we're always trying to change what we have and we're trying to build a consensus by convincing our colleagues that the evidence we've looked at or the theory we have or the methods we're using are are one of the right ways to go about doing this. And so, you know, that's just life. I, I don't see that as a problem. Of course, a new idea is not going to have a ton of traction immediately because it's brand new. It's the first time people are hearing it and thinking about it and evaluating it. But in Graham's case, this idea goes back 200 years. So it's not exactly new, you know? So, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I don't know, look, let's also go read what Galileo has written or Isaac Newton. I mean, amidst their really cool ideas that have stuck is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> if you go read them, it's a bunch of stuff that we now know is not true. And so that's just sort of life as well. None of us are 100% correct. And so, yeah. I yeah. think it helps. And a message that we try to communicate on the podcast as well is that when you're dealing with an area where people aren't specialists in it, and this applies with journalists as much as like uh, just media consumers, there mm -hmm. there is often a tendency to, you know, like take single articles as completely vindicated. And yes, there can be articles which are very convincing, right, of some new theory or some uh, bombastic new evidence. But usually, most people in academia understand that a new article is a single piece of a puzzle and that yeah. you, need, you need a lot more to change a consensus. So it could be the case that somebody proposes something and they present evidence and, and there is resistance, sometimes unfair resistance. But in many cases, you actually need to amass a large amount of evidence to knock over like a previous consensus so because graham for example focused a lot on this paper that was retracted right and yeah, a, a lot yeah. of grievance around that but if your overall you know like body of evidence was strong any individual paper being knocked wouldn't out, matter yeah it, it shouldn't matter but a lot was put on that like by you taking this out, you've essentially completely destroyed the careers of various, you know, well-intentioned scholars and whatnot. And I, but to the lay listener, that yeah. I think is compelling where they're like, well, why would they force a paper to be removed from the literature? Like that seems like bullying. So I think you have that issue about like the lay perception of science and how it yeah. advances and what the reality is, which is like much less exciting. 
<laughs> and and that paper is such a weird odd duck let's say archaeology papers are rarely retracted it's not a common thing for archaeology papers to be retracted i've only seen two in my life and they were both in the last year and uh, at least that i know of and have paid attention to and and what's weird is in both cases the papers were done by groups that are associated with this kind of lost civilization idea and so uh, one of them, it had nothing to do with lost civilization. It was about a meteor impact in Hopewell in the, in the U.S. And, and much later, we're talking, they, they weren't disputing the dates, but it was about whether that could have been a destruction. And it was, some of the authors on that paper were part of this comet research group who also supports the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis and this lost civilization idea. Um, and then this one was done by these team of Indonesian geologists. And they, you know, the leader author, he's written a book, Plato Never Lied, Atlantis is in Indonesia. And so he's very much uh, associated with Graham Hancock and with these ideas. He even acknowledged Graham Hancock in the in the paper saying, mm -hmm. thank you for da 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 da. And so in both those cases, they're very strange. They're obviously at the forefront of this kind of cultural war between this disparate group of pseudoscientists and the disparate group of actual scientists. And so I don't know, I was never saying that it should be retracted. I'm not sure if it was a good idea or not. There's all kinds of archaeological literature that has since been disproven. But I do think that, especially in the case with the Indonesian paper that he was bringing up, it certainly was published in very bad faith. They didn't acknowledge the actual archaeological excavations that have occurred at the site. I actually uh, got in touch with the archaeologists who did major excavations there, published a book on it, but in Indonesian. So it's not known outside of the, the world of East Asian archaeology. And so uh, what that meant is is this team could just ignore him and publish in English and just ignore the fact that all these excavations had occurred and that they actually explained what, the site, what was going on with the site. And so that was one of the examples of how this was like blatantly in bad faith they're just ignoring this other team that's there and uh not citing it not engaging with it or anything and so it was very very strange i i I don't know the details about why it was retracted, though, or anything like that. But I do find it funny that they claim that this this has been suppressed when, yes, the term retracted is in front of the paper, but the entire paper is still online and, and available for free and all the text and all the figures and everything. And so it's like nothing has been suppressed. You can go still read it yourself if you want to and uh, make your own opinions if you see what I mean. Flint, how did you um, come to the attention of Joe Rogan? Like what was the secret of, of events that sort of led to you um, going on there. Yeah, not Joe Rogan. It was actually through Graham Hancock that I ended up okay. going on there. So I, like I said, I was starting to do some research on Atlantis. And then when his TV show came out, it was very aggressive against archaeologists. And I wrote a Twitter thread that weekend after seeing it with a couple bottles of wine with my wife. And, uh, <laughs> and so I wrote a Twitter thread basically saying, what the what the hell? Why are you declaring war on archaeologists? You go to archaeological sites. You're It's because of archaeologists you have stuff to write about. And, you know, I sort of laid out how he how he was being very aggressive towards us and why his arguments were wrong, in a sense, a preview of what I talked about uh, on Joe Rogan. And that Twitter thread went viral, which led to the invitation to publish in the conversation. A lot of people read that. And then in the meantime, Graham was very upset with the pushback he was getting from archaeologists. So he started challenging people to some sort of debate. And in particular, he wanted to debate this guy, Professor John Hoops at Can University of mm -hmm. Kansas, who has been, I guess, his main antagonist for a decade or two in the archaeology community. And uh, John refused to. And so Graham kept getting more and more antagonistic, calling John Hoops a coward, insulting the rest of us as insignificant nobodies. And so I wrote like this public letter on Twitter saying, look, I am an actual archaeologist. I've excavated at all these different sites. I've taught at all these different places. I've published on all this stuff. If you want to sit down and chat, if you're going to call my colleague a coward, then let's do this. And because Joe had put out a very specific invitation in an episode, he said, I'd love to hear what archaeologists think about your ideas, Graham. So I quoted that. And uh, Graham saw that and, and, and invited me and announced it. And then literally the next day, I found out my cancer had returned to my lymph nodes. And so uh, I had to have surgery, remove all of them. I was on therapy for a year, so I kept delaying it until it actually happened. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the story there. It was a long story. But yeah, I, but it was Graham that actually proposed it to Joe Rogan's team that me and him go on there and then do it. And he was very keen on doing this even after my my cancer came and he found out about that he's like you got to do this you promised you would you know that kind of thing and i'm like all right well let me finish this shit you know let's make sure i'm not gonna die or something like he was very understanding of my cancer other people were not 
One pseudo-archaeologist online, Bright Insight, this guy Jimmy Corsetti, accused me of inventing my cancer to, because I was scared of going on Joe Rogan. He's, a, he's not a very nice guy, despite having a million and a half YouTube subscribers. And uh, he thinks Atlantis is in, what, East Africa? No, no, West Africa. But yeah, so it was an adventure dealing with all of those people as well that were trying to give me shit for having cancer and it's just like fuck you you know like <laughs> the, de the depths that you would sink to flint the, the, like uh, irradiating yourself to avoid the to be a butt you were you were dragged there a year later so you know they yeah. even that Self-inflicted cancer couldn't uh, deter you from it. <laughs> from the damn and, sun is what it was from. Yeah, <laughs> and I, and well, speaking to that as well, as we talked about, there's a lot of people in science and in academia that are very ambivalent about engaging with people that are seen as like pseudoscientists or, or fringe theorists or these kind of things. However, as noted by you and, and by Joe and various others, like, there's a lot of interest, right? Uh, because Netflix shows and, and best-selling books and that kind of thing. And your episode with Joe, I think it's fair to say, the reception, including amongst people that were favorably disposed initially towards Graham, not all of them, obviously, but a lot of people <laughs> seem to have reevaluated quite a lot from your performance, which is to your credit. But I'm, I'm kind of curious about your opinion about the value of engaging in that kind of public discourse because you know a lot of academics are reticent to do it but in this case it seems to have done a lot for at least giving a public response from the archaeological field so yeah i'm just curious about your thoughts you know not just in archaeology but in general about the value of engaging with people that are, you know, fringe theorists or alternative theorists? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think there's definitely value in doing it. That's why I did it. But I think we need to be careful and strategic in how we go about doing it. We pick the battles that, A, we're not going to give extra oxygen to something that is lacking in oxygen, right? You know, this amplification. We don't want to do that. So I don't think we should go and engage with every single pseudoscientists or fringe theorists out there. I think if we're going to engage, we should make sure that we're reaching new audiences. That was one of my goals, because this is an audience of people that are interested in archaeology that have probably never heard an actual archaeologist at length, right? And so that's an opportunity. I mean, so when 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 we first started thinking about this kind of pseudoscience creeping up on us in in the world, like in the last decade or two, you know, a lot of times what what we saw were activists on that side coming into our spaces and sort of using them to to amplify their message and find a new audience, right? And mm -hmm. now at this point, I think that group of of conspiracy theorists, of fringe scientists, they have huge audiences, and so we should be the activists that can go in there and try to get this audience audience to understand what we have to say. It's an opportunity that we we should be taking advantage of is what I think. But I think, again, it has to be done with clear preparation, understanding the audience and the venue, understanding the person you're talking to, not just going and talking to some person who does not have an audience, but instead talk to the people that have a large audience that you can make a difference on. I'm not going to lie. I did not expect it to go as well as it did. I did not expect to convince nearly as many of Graham Hancock's fans as I have. I've seen thousands of either private messages or public posts of people that were Graham Hancock fans that some of them still are, but they recognize now the value of real archaeology. Many of them are not, and they recognize the value of real archaeology. That I did not expect. I actually thought most of what I'd be doing was addressing people who were in the middle who did not know much about it. And I'd be able to kind of, what's the phrase, uh, inoculate them, I suppose, against this point of view by, by showing them what science actually has to say. And so I, I have to say to some credit that's due to Joe Rogan being, you know, reasonably, he I think his mind was changed a little bit over the course of the conversation. And so that, that was important and valuable to make it go even more successful than I thought it could have. But I do think that there is value in engaging. We just need to be careful and we need to do so backed up on sort of more recent research on how to engage with misinformation. That was another one of my big goals in my prep. I didn't want to go to the same old playbook that, you know, Carl Sagan developed a few decades ago. Uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm. I see a lot of people in the skeptics community taking that approach, but then you're 
you're giving the, the initiative back to the pseudoscientists by letting them give facts and then you have to sit there and debunk them. We need to be more assertive in how we mm -hmm. go about pre-bunking and moving the conversation along ourselves rather than them moving the narrative along and us responding. And so that was another big sort of preparation I'd done. That's why I had to do those practice debates to make sure that I was ready to move the conversation and not sort of respond. I didn't want to be responding at any point in time and of course, it's the points where I was responding where the, it was the, where I was coming off the worst, right? But by yeah. taking control of the conversation as much as I could, I was able to to stay on the offensive and be assertive. Yeah. Is, is this related to the sort of truth sandwich approach where like the, the way I see it, when you look at someone like Graham Campbell, then you, you've got Graham Hancock. Hancock, damn it. <laughs> um, someone who's got so many degrees of freedom to spin a good story because they're unencumbered by having to stick to any kind of things like evidence. But, but what that means is that the story is very entertaining and very fascinating. So if you're in the, the debunking mode, then it's an entirely negative reactive kind mm. of point of view. And am I right in understanding that is that what you try to do is kind of lay out like a parallel narrative that is true, that is supported by all kinds of interesting facts and convey some of the interest and excitement mm. that, that comes with engaging with real archaeology in your case? Yeah, so. I think that's exactly how I put it. We want to put out the positive of what we have. And I think that that comes across much better. But it also you know, it's like it's like we we know that people that are armed with facts are less likely to be enamored by these pseudoscientific narratives, and so that's the idea is to just arm them with facts as quickly as possible. And uh, you know, I didn't really treat it as a debate. Never, I, I I didn't think of it as a debate. To me, it wasn't a debate. We didn't have much of a structure. We had a slight structure we agreed upon. We'd each have three 10 minute blocks and I'd get to go first. That was sort of all we had. And other than that, it would be a conversation with PowerPoints. And so, you know, I never, th I, I saw it as a spectacle. Look, this is this is me performing for an audience. And in, in a sense, I prepared more as if I was giving a lecture a conversational lecture in front of a million people. And so, you know, that was kind of how I went about doing it. And that, that would be what I'd recommend to everybody. We can't see this as a debate because seriously, what actual science gets decided in a debate? Like it gets decided in peer reviewed journals. It gets decided in writing. We don't, I've never even been to a conference, an academic conference where there's been a debate. This is like some misconception of, of, of scholarship. And so I see no reason to think of this as a debate because it's not, it's a, it's a performance as a spectacle where the audience, you're trying to connect to the audience. And that's the main goal there. That's who you're sort of geared in on and locked in on is to speak to them in a way that is uh, going to show them what, what real scholarship has has to say what real archaeology or science has to say yeah and in an interesting and entertaining way for sure you know yeah did the fedora the suit and stuff like that i think i see today you're you're dressed quite conservatively <laughs> but you're a little little bit more flamboyantly on the on you on look the show. like a, a time traveler <laughs> <laughs> like an archaeological time traveler i mean look you know i study ancient images right so from ancient greece and stuff like that if you look at sort of paintings on pots deities heroes they have their signifiers that tells the audience who they are very quickly. And we do this in our TV shows. The nerds all have very thick glasses on and pocket protectors. The jocks are all in football uniforms. And you know, this is just how people quickly typecast who's there. And so look, I love my hat. I actually do wear it all the time. I just <laughs> don't do it when I have headphones on. But in that audience, I was like, I got to keep them on and that was <laughs> i asked joe rogan's team for headphones that would work with a hat and they assured me they'd have it and then they gave me normal headphones and i was like no i have to hold these on the entire time <laughs> but uh yeah i think it's easier to just play into who we are for the general public you know i have fun wearing my hat i got it at a flea market in santiago chile it's not actually a fedora it's a south american <laughs> yeah. hat and, i dare uh, you not <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I, and so, I actually have a, i actually have a fedora a real fedora <laughs> uh, and i've worn I, it i wear it <laughs> the fedora is too wide for my head it makes me look silly um, but <laughs> And I'm working I, to get a replacement for this hack because it's falling apart. It's 10 years old, but I have not found one yet. And uh, yeah, look, we just got to play into the role that we have. I think it's silly if we try to pretend we look like a, a businessman or something like that. That's not our role. You know, we're trying to look like an academic or an archaeologist or whoever we are. And let's just make that clear, crystal clear, so we can move on to our content and our points. 
you know. You could have went for the Jordan Peterson tried and tested three piece tuxedo suit that he wore <laughs> to, to Rogan one inexplicably. Well, <laughs> I mean, do kitchen. you guys have some advice on how I can become a guru after this? Oh, oh there's plenty, oh, yeah. plenty of ways that you could. <laughs> but but I, I, I think you're too covered by evidence that it, it wouldn't work. But yeah. but I mean, your your name, Flint, and I know it comes from your dad. I I heard you mention that your brother's name is Chip, right? Uh, mm-hmm. As well, and your your dad, for anybody who doesn't know, also a, a well known archaeologist. And I think that, in large part, and you know, to your credit as well, you're an endearing person, right? But the the presentation was good, and I think you fulfilled the stereotype that some people had <laughs> about an archaeologist, and and yeah. it helped. It it genuinely helped, I think, because they they then were prepared to pay attention, you know, to yeah. uh, a bit more. And, and one thing that I would say is I I studied a bit of re, uh, relevant research about archaeology, but, but very superficial in like evolutionary anthropology sense. And I remember reading papers about the dental analysis of animal remains, which I believe you've done a bunch oh, yeah. of work on. Um, yeah. When I, I remember as, an, as a master's student, finding out that people could look at the Weller patterns or, you know, various other things. I'm sure you could go into much more detail because of the various buildup on the dental record of deceased animals. And that blew my mind that we could trace, you know, migration patterns and flora and fauna patterns and Weller patterns via like teeth remains. And in the mm-hmm. presentation you've given Rogan, I think making those kind of details and talking about all the stuff that modern archaeologists are doing that was really effective because it, it did, like Matt said, it reframed it from just a negative debunking of you saying, no, there's nothing fun, you know, like there's no Atlantis. These things that look like man-made, they're all just natural. Instead shifting to, but we are doing really interesting and exciting things and it doesn't exactly. get talked about enough. And I thought that was really effective, at least for me. <laughs> I mean, that's my biggest gripe about how archaeology is presented. It's presented in the same 20th century way still in the media. You know, it's the big monuments. It's all this kind of stuff, except for DNA. DNA is the one thing that has sort of uh, made a, a dent in public opinion and and narratives that we can talk about. And so it's just really frustrating. Every single journalist only publishes on the oldest this, the oldest that, which buys into one of Graham's main arguments, which is things keep getting older. But what that is, is that's a bias from the media and what they present. Mm-hmm. And so it really frustrates me to see this kind of TV shows and the way it's often not not good science journalism. There is good science journalism, but I mean more of the popular stuff. And so yeah. it's just, you know, we have to fight back. We have to present what we're actually doing. And we're we're in this climate of so much anti-intellectualism. And so we have to think through how to break through and make what we do interesting and exciting and show the 21st century approaches that we have. And it's not easy, but I strongly believe that we have to stand up and do something. I mean, you guys have your podcast, you're definitely doing that. And I think I think we need to convince more of our colleagues in general to do that. In whatever way we all do it, there's no real wrong way in my opinion. I think we just all need to speak up is, is how I see it and build this ecosystem. Yeah, and try some stuff. Yeah, I think that's particularly important given that there's so many commonalities in in the kind of disinformation that's happening across disciplines. For example, when I, when I was watching the interview of yours and I was just struck by how similar Graham Hancock uh, have I got that right this time? Was <laughs> yes, you got it right. You got it right. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt Ridley, who who wrote Viral: The Search for the Origin of COVID nineteen, which is like a, like uh-huh. a lab leak truth type thing. Um, very different topic, but the presentation, like the self styling as renegades outside, excluded from the the institutions, which are all trying to suppress this much protect more protect their exciting- funding. Yeah. Yeah. Protect their funding. Yeah. So, 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 so it's the same. And, but, uh, if I found the land, but I what get funding? So much funding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, the, the other pattern there, too, apart from they sort of have a similar delivery style, but um, they're often sort of the journalists or writers, people who, who are used to writing popular books, who, who yeah. are used to appealing to like like know what sells essentially mm-hmm. and so it's a, it's just a very different criterion than from what academics are used to focusing mm-hmm. on right i mean yes but look we teach introductory level courses you know we are trained to teach 
introductory level courses to people that have had no experience thinking about our field. Mm -hmm. And so I think we all have more training in speaking to the public than we think. And what I think is really interesting is, look, uh, I think academics, for some reason, too many of my colleagues have this mindset where when you teach introductory courses, you don't want to dumb things down because you're trying to teach your students. And the students, by and large, if we're, if we're trying to pay attention to them, they catch up over the course of the semester and they come out, you know, uh, knowing the content of that introductory course. On the other hand, when we talk to the public, we have this mindset we need to dumb things down. And I think what we need to do is just make sure we explain things clearly without dumbing it down. And uh, I think we have more skills than we give ourselves credit for. I've seen a lot of this comment as well that we just were outmanned in terms of communication. And it's like, how many lectures have you all done? You know, we, we give so many lectures all the time. And I get it. Some academics are certainly not very skilled at giving lectures, but a whole hell of a lot of us actually are. And, and it's not just a few of us. It's a, I, I could think of dozens of archaeologists that just give fantastic, phenomenal lectures that win teaching awards and stuff like that. And so, you know, and I'm sure that's true in every single field out there. And so I think we need to be leveraging that ability and, and practicing and thinking about what works best. I mean, don't get me wrong. This was not the first time I gave an engaging lecture. This is based on decades of me speaking to the public. And so it takes a lot of thought to be self-critical and self-reflexive on what works and what doesn't. And you, I think the biggest key is don't dumb things down, but get rid of as much of the technical language as possible. That's the key is to learn how to speak using the right vocabulary, but still keeping it nuanced and, and interesting and complex. You know, saying instead of Pleistocene, you say Ice Age, you know, that kind of stuff, mm. which I saw someone critique me for. It's like, it's not the end of the Ice Age, it's since the last glacial maximum. And it's like, Yes, but I'm not going to be talking about that to a general audience, you know? That's really interesting, Blim, because in our case as well, there is, you know, we, we do a podcast for a general audience and we talk about our speciality and, and sometimes forget, right, like that we are making references which psychologists will know or uh, social science, people have studied social sciences, but not the general public. And um, the I will say that myself, I have had this, like sort of bifurcation, if you want, where there's my academic work where I talk in a certain way with a certain kind of delivery. And of course, I try to be engaging with students as well, but it's different than when I talk to a general audience. But I think you're exactly right that actually there is a whole bunch of the skills which overlap. And if you took it that you were speaking to an introductory class, and you don't need, like in introductory classes as well, I try to avoid too much technical language because it's alienating, right, initially mm -hmm. to people to be overloaded with terminology. So it's just something I haven't thought of that much that actually, because I've seen the reverse happen where doing the podcast has made me better at giving uh, like formal presentations. Uh, exactly. Me too. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think of it going. The, you know, I mean, to be honest, direction. I I even advise graduate students or people giving you know academic conference papers. You don't know who your audience is. Look, I, I do this, uh, my research, it bridges two very different subfields in archaeology. I do classical Greek stuff, and then I do an archaeological science and environmental archaeology. And they're two completely different disciplines and approaches. And so anytime, I, some of this actually comes from me struggling to give academic conference papers where my audience is so di dispersed and divided. If I talk about zooarchaeology, the classical archaeologists don't understand. If I talk about classical Greek archaeology, the zooarchaeologists don't understand. So I've learned that even in an academic conference setting to try to strip away as much of the, the technical language as possible so that you can hit the people that are not in your subfield, right? And that's really important. I think the only time really technical jargon is useful is useful is in advanced courses where you're you know especially graduate level studies where you're teaching people who might, might end up in the field and then in our actual you know academic scholarship because in that case you need to be as precise as possible and so i think in most you know, oral verbal settings, we should be trying to strip this language away. It just makes it more accessible and easily understandable, even by colleagues who are in slightly different disciplines. I just want to interject that Flint, you asked about like becoming a guru and you've got it completely wrong. You need to increase the jargon, add references, the obscure yes, figures. It is true. You've got this the wrong way around <laughs> if you want to be a successful guru. <laughs> and I was going to say, as you were saying, look, if we make some mistakes and have a little bit of jargon in there, that's okay. Because 
yes, these gurus use a lot of jargon to make their arguments incomprehensible and make them sound more uh, well-read or intelligent or something than they actually are. And so, yeah, so if we if we if we slip up and have a little bit in there, that's okay. It's, we can't beat ourselves up too much. I was watching a video on YouTube about you about your your debate. Uh -oh. just released through there. <laughs> some account called what is it called? Atu Atun Schaefer. Oh yeah, I anyway. saw that attention, one, yeah. attention, yeah. attention. Oh, is oh, it really? Yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, he was saying quite similar things to you, Flynn, in that he was saying, you know academics or anyone who has got some specialist geeky hyper specialized knowledge on on a, on any topic um get out there do your best to, to to present it in an engaging way on on the internet because there's a massive audience out there of people that are just looking like you'd be surprised how many people will be interested in yeah you know yeah. um you know, dating, you know, analyzing the fossilized teeth of ruminant animals, for instance. And <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I myself, am, I'm always talking about my podcast list and it's the most obscure things that have nothing to do with anything that I know about. So I am the, the absolute lay audience there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I think perhaps this relates to your idea about like winning these debates, which is which is about not so much adopting a negative frame of mind, um, debunking things all the time, but rather presenting the the engaging and truthful sort of alternative. Yeah, I mean, I think there's room for debunking. It needs to happen to some degree, but I think uh, I think the way to win this for real is to really show the public why science and scholarship and uh, is so important, you know, and what we actually can say and what we're actually doing. That's that's the real goal there. I mean, I don't know if you guys have made it all the way through, but at the end, I had both Joe Rogan and Graham Hancock agreeing that that archaeology should be funded but better, and we should not be stripping funding away from it. And so, you know, that's that's the real end goal here. We need to show how we are relevant and how you know we need to support you know universities and and scholarship and and research. We live in this climate where it's just being cut and devastated so badly. It's not just archaeology; it's most of our arts and sciences. And so, we need to sit there and and think through how to how to speak to the public better. And I think, yeah, an all hands on deck approach I think is better than nothing. We should just we should be doing that and prioritizing that because if we just continue prioritizing scholarship that just our colleagues read. Soon we're going to have, and already we have a lot fewer colleagues than we did, you know, ten years ago. And so yeah. we need to make sure that we protect our our fields of study. But Flint, that contradicts what you said about big archaeology having <laughs> its reach. I I just want to, and I, you know, on the Rogan, like the end of it. One thing that I will also say that I really uh, appreciated was obviously in the nature of like a back and forth and whatever there'll be moments where both sides are going to get frustrated with the way that people are presenting things or whatever and there are points that are raised that people can't respond to and i think it's to graham's credit that like at large points he you know he didn't interrupt or anything like that mm -hmm. and uh, during the presentations but the the other thing is that at the end the very end whenever there was this call to say, you know, archaeologists, just be respectful, just be kind, you know, stop bullying people with alternative deers, try to have a bit, can't we all be nice here? And I really appreciated that at the end of four hours, if that is a call to like, you know, everybody hold hands and say, yes, like archaeologists can do better. And you made the point in response that this is a very different tone from what you've taken in your work and in your documentaries. And if you were adopting that kind of tone, the response would be different. And I, I thought that exactly. was impressive to see because you could have just, you know, avoided saying that, but you you made it clear. And it was a completely valid point because, yeah. you know, the, the, that's why I was yeah. there because he took that antagonistic tone towards us, which led to me writing that Twitter thread. And he tried to like, back off from that and it's like dude sorry you you are just as aggressive as anybody else has ever been against you you go into the trenches and you spit venom at archaeologists and at archaeology is an entire discipline and so i'm sorry i'm not going to feel that and and we had agreed beforehand over email that we would have just a respectful conversation sticking to evidence and not attack each other. And he went in there and tried to twist my words and stuff like that. And look, we shook hands afterwards. We were very friendly with each other and, and, and we're pleased. But like, you know, like, I'm sorry, dude, you you specifically reneged on that. And uh, so I don't feel too bad at all about you losing fans because you were the one that was trying to turn me into some sort of, I don't know, right wing hate figure. 
and uh, yeah. to bring up this kind of stuff that I never said about him. And so uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. It's just it is what it is. And yeah, that that came across loud and clear. That that's that sort of sense of of grievance and uh, a kind of sour. Sour, it was it was sourness. one of the topics of the presentation. Was, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, one yeah. of his key things. And <laughs> and it was so funny because I mean, you know, Joe Rogan seemed to try to dissuade him from going that direction. He he realized yes. that I was going respectful and evidence-based. And so Graham's like, I want to get to how Flint is manipulating the media. And Joe's like, let's yeah. talk about this archaeological site. Yeah. And so it's just like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. my yeah. God. Yeah. 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 Joe Joe isn't always that good, but he did, <laughs> he did <laughs> yeah. relatively yeah. well then. I was surprised too. Yeah. And I know we've taken up a bunch of your time, but I, I do have a sort of indulgent tangential question while we have a real uh -oh. archaeologist here <laughs> yeah that i'm i'm curious about i have my own opinions about it but they're based on much less familiarity with the relevant research so there's two topics that i think it would be interesting to get your opinion on and they do speak to i think debates in uh archaeology or i don't know the correct term paleontology anyway the uh one is the evidence for neanderthal rituals and the, mm -hmm. the kind of arrangement of stones in caves, whether that is convincing evidence of like ritualistic patterns, or I've seen people talk it might be produced by bears, or uh, the, that's one question. And the second one, which is probably more uh, a longer and unfair thing to layer on top, is about the ongoing debate about the warfare in human history, and whether we have evidence for you know the some people are saying warfare is a modern invention that only comes with nations and others are saying no very much a part of human nature going back it's just that we weren't capable of doing you know the large scale warfare that you see so i i realize that's probably quite a lot to layer in the two-part question but why do we have you here so okay so i'll address the first one first neanderthal ritual behavior. So this was something that my dad was one of the leading researchers on, actually, and he'd be the person to ask if he had not passed away six years ago. But uh, he was a, a skeptic, let's say, of that argument about Neanderthal ritual behavior. He went to many sites that had been excavated decades earlier. And for example, there was this one site called Fonte Shavad. It was actually the first excavation I ever excavated at when I was like 16 years old. And so this site sort of has it all. It has a new lithic stone tool typology. Um, it has a burial in it. And it has uh, what look like hearths, these sort of black lenses of, mm. of early fire usage. And what he found with re-excavating it, use, uh, collaborating with geoarchaeologists and geologists who would excavate the sediments and stuff like that, is that actually everything in the cave had been washed in from a chimney above. And so the what looked like hearth lenses were actually manganese stains in the sediments. Um, what looked like a burial in this niche in the bedrock, actually those niches in the bedrock were all there naturally. This body had been washed in from above and slumped and settled into this natural niche. And then this new stone tool ty ty technology, typology, it was actually a sign of water rolled lithics. So stones that had been chipped and damaged from water rolling. And that's why it was observed all the way from Europe through Asia, because it's actually a sign of natural processes, not anthropogenic processes. Um, um, so I think that there's a lot of debate about many of these contexts that show Neanderthal ritual behavior. I think some of the clearest are in Southwest Asia. There's now similar re-excavations where people went back to Shanidar, where there's what's called the flower burial. Uh, it turns out that it's not a flower burial, the flower pollen they had, that's naturally introduced. But it does seem like the argument that that was an intentional burial of sorts is legitimate. And I think most scholars now accept that. Um, so there is room for considering Neanderthal ritual behavior. But the evidence at this point is, is, is there, but also still quite slim. So it's about understanding how widespread these kind of ritual activities were and what they actually meant for our cousins, these Neanderthals. As my dad always put it, you can think about human or scholarship towards Neanderthals, it's like a pendulum. And so in different decades, it goes from people thinking they're just like humans to people thinking they're completely different from us humans. And so I think right now we're in this period where a lot of scholarship is talking about how they're very similar to humans, mm -hmm. but I imagine that it'll keep swinging back and forth because of how do we define what human means? What does human behavior yeah. mean? And one of the clearest ways we can look at that is to look at kind of 
you know, closely related uh, species and, and hominid groups. But Flint, look at the photograph. It looks like a half. Look at the photo. <laughs> it's all manganese. <laughs> Have you seen no, no, the, the photo? The photo. <laughs> the, the, the... And, and, and another thing, though, also, is we're slowly understanding, you know, the behavior of, uh, of other species that are still alive, different primates. And uh, I think that's also important because, you know, like we see that other species mourn their dead, for example, and, and stuff like that. And so I think it, what this really helps us understand is what it means to be human. And that's really mm. what it all comes down to. What do we see as human behavior and how do we identify that as different or mm. similar to behavior of, of other species? Um yeah, your second question is more difficult. I don't have as many clear examples. I do think there's some examples of Stone Age battles that took place. I'm, I'm, I think there's one in Central Europe. It must be from like the Neolithic period. Near a river, I think there's a, a battlefield that was excavated, but I'm blanking on where it is exactly. So that's something I'm less familiar with. I'm not sure if I could say that warfare is intrinsic to human behavior. I tend to think that what archaeology has shown is just the diversity and heterogeneity and complexity of human behavior around the world. That, that's why I, there is no grand narrative of human progress. It's something that I think that Graham Hancock taps into, but even like Barack Obama, he talks about, you know, I remember he gave his last speech before he left office, and he talks about, you know, how historians of the future will judge things, and it's the, the human arc of progress and stuff like that. And it's like, look, there is no grand overarching arc of progress. What history is, is it's all the actions of different humans around the world, right? It's not like there's some clear direction we're all heading into. We could all be extinct from an atomic bomb soon, in which case we are a lot less resilient and successful than Neanderthals who survived two times longer than us, or we might be able to figure out how to keep surviving. And so I think thinking of anything as intrinsic to us, that falls into some of the traps that we see with human, uh, what is it, evolutionary psychology, which a lot of your gurus subscribe to, I, I imagine. And so I think that we need to be careful about that because as soon as we start uh, identifying behaviors as universal, we always find a bazillion exceptions. And so I think that that's important to acknowledge that that there is no, you know, what we do and the actions we have and the behavior we have is very plastic and very dependent upon context and environment and, and the, the the sort of social environment that we're raised in. And and so I think that that's really important to recognize. So I, I, I wouldn't think of warfare as universal, but yes, we certainly have a lot of evidence for warfare once we start having more complex groups of people. People and, and especially larger populations and, and things like that. So it's something that certainly occurs. We know that intra, intra social violence happens all the time, and it's a real yeah. shame when we find it, but it is, it's, it's part of how we can behave, how some of us can behave is maybe the right way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate your perspective on things. And in some way, there are some parallels about those debates, right? But I, I think there's more legitimate ground to for people to take different positions on it because you know in the respect of what graham was saying to you is we haven't excavated you know we all of the earth so we can't say there's no ancient civilization and superficially people could say that people positing like a significant intergroup conflict are likewise lacking evidence right because the you know the, but the reality is that like although we do have a lot of interesting remains and biological ancient skeletons are actually few and far between and tissue damage i believe you know doesn't fossilize particularly well so you end up with more room for people like kind of debating what the evidence shows or not on that but i i i think the point about there being a lot of diversity around the world in human societies and not seeing everything along a simple you know like evolutionary yeah. ladder i mean i think the only thing that's universal among human groups is that we have to eat <laughs> you know, like and drink. I mean, it's our biological needs that are universal. And then other than that, look, we all behave differently and respond differently to the environment that we're in. And so I but we can detect sort of violence that should show up reasonably clearly in, in bones, bones uh, you know, skeletal remains. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we definitely can. And we do. But at the same time, I don't think it's something that's we uh, identifying universal behaviors is is very tricky, as I'm sure you know from uh, anthropology and psychology. I mean, look, everybody's yeah. different, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, there are indicators that, like, if somebody is damaged by, you know, like weapons or whatever. But if somebody breaks a bone, was it 
like because they fell down or was it because they you yes, know like yeah, yeah. there's you, you can never really like well there, you can tell in certain cases but like generally speaking not and then i also think that the one thing that is going off in my head though <laughs> yeah flint and it's it's probably like my argumentative capacity is that when i think of human societies at least once we start getting into modern humans i feel like one uh, universal, I might posit, and this is partly because I'm a ritual scholar, is rituals. Like, and I don't mean, yeah. I mean just ritualized behavior in the broadest sense, greeting rituals, you know, like uh, symbolic objects being used in ritual circumstances. Like, I feel that, you know, even our, some of our very earliest examples seem to talk about a symbolic culture for humans so it's just a it is literally because i study rituals that i'm like maybe rituals card does a you would do no and i think that that's that's one of the big arguments with neanderthals and that's what's so interesting is with modern homo sapiens anatomically modern humans homo sapiens we can start detecting sort of symbolism and ritual in the archaeological record fairly quickly we have you know examples of that whether it's shell beads or something like that and yeah. so what we, we with neanderthals it seems to be so much less so. Um, and so I think that that in and of itself is significant. And, you know, some of the people think that maybe Neanderthals were influenced by contact with with modern Homo sapiens as Homo sapiens radiated around and that might have impacted their behavior. One of my another point my dad always made is, is Neanderthal stone tool technology changes very, very, very slowly compared to humans where we're constantly innovating and changing what we do. And so I, I think that there's just something that's very different there behaviorally between them. But I'm, Again, probably not me. I, I don't study Neanderthals, but uh, <laughs> my dad and some of his f uh, former colleagues definitely think that way or thought that way. And so it's a pendulum. And I think I agree with you, but I think ritual is a, is a form of communication. It's a way yeah, that we yeah. communicate to each other different things. It's just a, it's a different way of communication that's nonverbal. And so, yeah. yeah, I think that that's that's one way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can see like you know ritual behaviors and animals depending on how you define them as well with like threat displays and that. But I will waffle on about rituals just just <laughs> to say, Flint. Like it, it's been an absolute pleasure. Your your debate with Rogan was very enjoyable for me to listen to, and I I've enjoyed this conversation. Sorry to indulge it in anthropology stuff no, at fine. the end, but uh, <laughs> I think that the lesson you give in science communication um, is a lot of the things that we're talking about on the podcast in a more positive version of what we are normally identifying negative things. So yeah, so thanks for thanks for coming on and thanks for doing all that preparation um, and giving yeah. like an interesting thing to listen to. Thanks for having me. I guess to everybody, check me out on YouTube or X slash Twitter. <laughs> Hopefully a book will come soon on Atlantis and uh, why we're not <laughs> looking for it and why actual archaeology is pretty cool and relevant. And uh, yep. yeah, but thank you both. You guys are doing a good job and uh, I really appreciate you inviting me to come on. Yeah. Thanks, Flint. We'll provide links to all that stuff in the show notes and um, we'll let you get on with your day. Chris will go to uh, a, a, a faculty event and I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, you deserve <laughs> to go to bed. <laughs> the academic life in the three stages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Breakfast, faculty event at night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Flint, and we'll speak to you again sometime, hopefully. Okay. So. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm around. <laughs>